Hello, how the tech are you? I'm doing tech and terrible because I lost all my money on crypto. <laughs> how about you? <laughs> um, I had to sell all of my crypto to make payroll one time. So a while ago, so. yeah, quite a while <laughs> ago. Uh, but I'm I'm doing tech and great except for this heat out here. Fair enough. I think everybody's uh, too hot right now. Um, what what do we got? So. This is our weekly tech show on Echoplex Media. We talk about tech stuff, tech news, any tech things we feel like talking about. I sometimes talk about lists, but I'm not doing that today. My, uh, what I'm covering today is uh, Tesla autopilot crashes a lot. Uh, perovskite solar cell breakthrough. Interesting thing with new uh, solar cells. And finally, Jack Dorsey announces Web 5. Don't know what happened to Web 4, but we're on Web 5. <laughs> Go ahead, Dave. Uh, yeah, I just got two stories this week, but they are a bit spicy, as I tend to be. I got SpaceX fires staffers behind an open letter criticizing Elon Musk. And then I have apparently a religious cult has a lot of influence inside of a film studio group at Google. Wow. And it's going to be going to be a wild one in my part of the my part of the show. Should be an interesting one. I forgot to mention that HK is out today. He's out on an adventure and he'll be hopefully back next week. Uh, and then the following week, I may be out on an adventure, but we'll uh, see how that goes. So I want to get started on my uh, first topic. My first one today is Tesla autopilot crashes a lot. Apparently crashed 273 times in less than a year. Now, there's a lot of Teslas on the road, so that's not terribly surprising. And we're talking about level two self-driving, which is really, so that's the autopilot. That's like advanced cruise control. That is not full self-driving, uh, but it's autopilot. That's in pretty much all Teslas right now. So if you're in cruise control, you can get it to uh, put it in autopilot and it'll follow the road, follow the cars in front of you and stuff like that. And you are supposed to be, if you're driving like that, you're supposed to be paying attention the whole time. However, everybody who works in self-driving car area knows that like, you can't assume, once you get to a certain level of automation, you can't assume that the driver is paying attention to anymore. And this autopilot has kind of crossed that threshold and is a bit dangerous. So, but I am not an expert in that area, so I don't want to go too much details into that. I don't know if I've, Dave has any comments on that. Just that every once in a while, we'll see a story where you see somebody in the backseat of their Tesla that got pulled over. Yeah. Or you'll see a story of like somebody else driving down the road in a regular car, videoing the guy next to him in a Tesla who's in the driver's seat fast asleep. I've seen that a few times. Don't do that. Don't, don't, don't ever do that. Anyways, uh, there was a lot of thought that the autopilot actually made cars safer because, you know, with computers driving, uh, they, you know, they're supposed to pay attention hundred percent of the time. And, and if they de can detect everything, they should reduce crashes. And Tesla actually originally claimed that autopilot led to 40% less crashes. Unfortunately, analysis by a company called quality control systems has analyzed uh, all these crashes and determined that to be a lie and or at least false. I <laughs> don't know if Tesla actually did the, ran the numbers. So, um, but yeah, it is, it is unclear if it is less safe or, you know, a little bit less safe or a little bit safer. It seems to be about the same as a driver, at least at this point. So, until they get better at uh, self-driving stuff, I would be very concerned about that. But because of all these crashes, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, NHTSA, uh, has a new standing order, which basically makes forces automakers to file a report on any crash involving level two ADAS, which is a self-driving level. So level two is basically advanced cruise control like is in Tesla cars. And there's a number of other cars that have similar features. Uh, this includes any incidents that have a vulnerable road user or resulted in a fatality, 
a vehicle tow away, an airbag deployment, or any individual being transported to the hospital for medical treatment. This makes, to me, makes total sense that, yeah, in any kind of incident, especially a serious one, including what, what they have listed there, uh, should be reported and we should track that. And hopefully over time, they will actually get better and become safer than, than regular people driving. But till then, be careful. But the final part of this, which you may, most people may have missed and may seem kind of unusual, is that the report must be filed if the level two ADAS system was operating within 30 seconds of the incident. And you may be wondering why that is the case. Like why would you turn it off for 30 seconds and then get into wreck? Well, apparently Tesla autopilot has been found, or at least has been engineered to actually shut off if a crash is imminent. And the idea is the autopilot would switch, would turn off and give control back to the driver to hopefully avoid the crash, but usually that they don't give nearly enough time. So they don't have this like 30 second rule. There's a lot of uh, Tesla crashes that would not have been included in these reports. So uh, the one thing that comes to mind immediately is I'm <clears throat> one of the things that you're going to be sort of cognizant of while you're driving is if other drivers are driving somewhat erratically. If other drivers yeah. seem to be going too slow, um, seem to be sort of not staying, you know, the cars move around a little, in a, cars will move around a little in a lane as they're yeah. driving. But if somebody's swerving, maybe due to alcohol or maybe due to just not paying attention and a human being knows to stay away from that car. Yeah. And I, I don't know that we're, I can't imagine that these systems are in a place where they're able to make those kinds of judgment calls. And so the, the reason I think that these systems aren't making driving safer is because there's no way for these systems to sort of intuitively predict the behavior of another driver the way that a human can. Yeah, I don't know about that because I've seen some interesting videos where the Tesla seems to be almost have like precognition. You'll, you'll hear it beep and warn of a, a crash eminent. And then suddenly a car veers into your lane and hit, and hits stuff. And it's, uh, you know, from some of these videos, it's pretty impressive. A lot of these wrecks from what I've, you know, read online is something where the autopilot, particularly like the camera system, the vision system just did not detect something like, you know, the first like major wreck that Tesla had, it was a big white truck, uh, a semi truck with uh you know the, the their trailer is big and white crossing lanes it's actually near here on 441 and the white of the truck blended in with the sky so the tesla didn't think it was there and ran straight into it even though the truck was stopped completely uh yeah. and that seems to be not the only thing there i've seen a number of other other wrecks where the tesla seemed to have done the same thing like it has problems detecting that that kind of situation well, yeah, the optics aren't just aren't your eyes, right? Like right. your eyes and and the way your brain processes the information coming from your eyes. There are, I mean, people who are religious point to your eyes as like a marvel. I don't right. share their view about the reason your eyes are that way. But, you know, you could see where someone might think that you you can process information and in just, I mean, before you've even like, like, um thought about it in any sort of way you're you're already making decisions based on the in input you're getting from your eyes even if you're not like cognizant of the decisions you're making and yeah as good as optics are getting and stuff i just think that that connection between your eyes and your brain is just going to be we're just not we can't possibly be there with a with a glass lens and a computer right and that's why certain other can other car makers are using like LIDAR because then it doesn't use the optics and that is apparently a lot better at, at detecting actual objects. Some Teslas have a LIDAR system, but apparently some of the newer Teslas have actually dropped that for I think price considerations because cameras are cheaper uh, to, to make and put in the, put in these cars in the LIDAR system. Oh, Still. I thought maybe some LIDAR guy like made fun of Elon Musk's haircut and he stopped using LIDAR. That might be true. <laughs> I think we have a story about that later, right? <laughs> right. Something, something similar <laughs> to that coming up later. Yeah. 
So I can't even read this word here. What is perv perv perovskite? What is this? Perovskite. Yes, I know that's it's took me a while to to pronounce that as well. So perovskite solar cell. Perovskite is a it's not actually a mineral, it's but it's a family of crystals. So you can make these crystals. They I don't know the details. I'm not a material scientist. I don't know how they're different from certain other crystals, but it's basically a crystal that's formed from multiple different elements. And they like there's multiple elements in the crystal itself, not like, you know, different elements making this type of crystal. Uh, and apparently they are they can be used to make solar cells. And on top of that, perovskite, because they're made from different elements, you can actually use elements that are quite a bit cheaper uh, than silicon. And I know like I, it wasn't in this article that I'm linking to in the note show notes on Ars Technica, but in a previous video that I watched online on YouTube somewhere, didn't find it for this, uh, for this show, unfortunately, uh, they seem to claim that the perovskite could actually make more efficient solar cells than, than silicon. But the issue has always been, even though it's cheaper to make and potentially more efficient, perovskite does not last very long exposed to sunlight. And for a solar cell, you kind of need to expose it to, <laughs> to sunlight. It's a kind of a requirement. And people have been playing with this for quite a while and trying to, to come up with a solution. And it sounds like certain scientists Sorry, I didn't get the exact uh, where the scientists are from or who they are. I think it's in the article. You have to look it up. But they figured out that they could, for one particular type of perovskite that can be used as a solar cell uh, in solar panels, they figured out that they could make a cap. And this cap is basically a similar material to the perovskite, but chemically a little bit different and not actually the same type of type of crystal. And what that does is the perovskite is kind of unstable and particularly there's particular atoms that tend to get, you know, bumped out of the structure uh, when exposed to sunlight for too long and adding the cap basically just keeps those atoms from being bumped out of place because they have no place to go. They, they, they would just like hit the cap and I, as far as I can tell, get pushed back into place. Um, and by doing this, by putting this cap on the perovskite cell, uh, even though the, the cap kind of reduced the efficiency to a certain respect, because, you know, it's kind of blocking a little bit of the light, uh, it actually, not only did it make the, the cell last longer, but it increased the efficiency slightly because these atoms are still kept in place, uh, well. So it was the... The durability of these new perov perovskite cells are now similar to silicon cells, not quite the same, but, uh, and the efficiency with this particular type that they tried is not as, as efficient, it's a little bit less efficient, but they haven't tried it with more efficient materials yet. And that is in the works, you know, they're going to do that in the future. But it looks like this could be a, a pretty big deal in the solar power energy industry. Any questions? I mean, it sounds neat, and I know absolutely nothing about it. Yeah, I thought it was pretty cool. I wanted to, to cover it. I don't have, like, I'm not a material science so I, scientist, so I don't know all the details. But uh, it could mean that uh, adding solar panels to your house could be a lot cheaper in the future. Hopefully, although you may have to replace them a little more often. Yeah, I just wonder a lot of times, a lot of this stuff, the the problem, the, the environmental problem is on the back end. Like, what do you do with it when you're done with it? Right. You know, it's not just, yeah, not just solar panels, but solar panels are a good example. Like earlier, solar panels were real bad trying to, uh, trying to dispose of because we, uh, part of what we, what people assumed we did at our old, at my old job was e waste. So sometimes yeah. people would leave their electronics junk like yeah. <laughs> in back of our warehouse. And usually it was just a computer or whatever. And we had a recycler that we would just take it to, but right. sometimes we'd get solar panels and we had some, you know, sometimes we had recyclers going, I ain't touching that thing. 
So we'd have to find wow. a specific place that re- recycled the solar panels. The newer ones seem to be better and we had less problems with it, but older ones, and I don't know the specifics of it. It's just, I, I could tell they were older and that sometimes we yeah. would have a harder time placing those with somebody that would dispose of them properly or lie to us and tell us they were going to dispose of them properly as is more often the case, I would imagine. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure about this, but I'm under the impression the perovskite is a lot of, uh, they have a lot of metals in them that, uh, should be easy to re- easier to recycle. Uh, I'm not positive on that though. Yeah, I don't know. And and I think you know they're they're not out. Like people aren't actually making them and using them. So uh, who knows? Yeah, I mean, right. what I could tell here, it's early days, at least for the. It's very early. Th- this technology that you're talking about here. Yeah, it's in the lab stage, right? So you have no idea. <laughs> uh, moving on. For a more controversial take, Jack Dorsey announces Web 5. <laughs> what happened to Web 4? Don't know. <laughs> We're not even sure entirely what Web 3 is at the moment. It has something to do with blockchain, right? And probably uh, some JPEGs or something, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a way rich people take your money. Yeah, I guess. Uh, but this is actually, uh, I, I guess, uh, Dorsey claims that the uh, Web3 is owned and controlled by venture capitalists and limited partners. I don't know that what that's supposed to mean, but maybe early adopters of blockchain technology, I guess. I don't know. Anyways, this Web5 thing that uh, Dorsey uh, is talking about was apparently developed by the Blockhead. Weird name, but it's a, apparently a a Bitcoin business use unit under Jack Dorsey's block company block formerly called square. I don't, I feel like block is a terrible name as well. Yeah. Just like but draws, it just, draws up images of like somebody being a blockhead, right? Yeah. That's, I mean, that's the name of this group too. So it, it sounds dumb, but I don't know. Is Dorsey a genius? I don't think so. Anyway, no, he's just got a beard and like likes to go on hikes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so what is Web Five? Well, supposedly it will allow users to own and control their own data and identity. And I don't know if you've seen other stuff that where people have tried to do this, where they, you know, you're you're able to control your data. That's it. They always say, and usually it's like you can control your data until you give it to like one company and then it's gone <laughs> and then it's everywhere. Right. Uh, and identity is and kind of interesting, but they, that's kind of been solved by a bunch of other companies anyways, or even just, uh, um, what am I thinking of password managers almost do that now for us. But the example there, were, I, two examples were given in this article. One, uh, is, Apparently it's about Alice who holds a digital wallet and she wants to sign up for a new decentralized social media app. But, uh, what happens is all her connections are already in this digital wallet somehow. So she can just sign up for this social media app and every, all her connections are moved over and all her posts are moved over to the, the new app automatically, which sounds like a terrible idea for me. Cause that just means, uh, everybody has access to all your connections and posts on social media. <laughs> this is not really protecting your data anyway. It's kind of the opposite of that. And if it's on blockchain, like I don't know how they intend to do this, but if it's on a blockchain, like that's kind of an open ledger that is permanent. It's a permanent record. And that's worse for something like social media stuff. Like, once that data is out there, you can't get it back. Right. That's kind of scary. Um, the second example is somebody called Bob, who's a music lover lover. And the idea is Bob can keep a list of all his music that he owns on a, what they call a decentralized web node. I don't know the point of that. Cause that just sounds like a web server to me. <laughs> I don't know what he's talking about. Decentral web, decentralized web node. But anyways, uh, any new music app he wants to use can then hit his decentralized web node to figure out what music he actually owns and can load it into that new 
music app that almost sounds like a good uh, use of NFTs, sort of. So you would, you know, buy rights to music and then be allowed to play it on a bunch of different uh, music apps. Feel like that that's not going to work somehow, <laughs> and and we kind of don't even own music anymore, anyway. Right, and it also sounds like the second example also just sounds like an IceCast server. Yeah, probably. I mean, I literally just have the second version. It's, you know, yeah. I have the rights to the music because the people have submitted it for uh, this network specifically, and people can go listen right. to it whenever we're not live. I literally have the second version. I mean, I understand that right. they want to call it a decentralized web node, but like you said, how is my, how is just a little server I propped up for 10 bucks a month not decentralized? I mean, I guess it's centralized in one place, but. No, I mean, that sounds exactly like a decentralized node of what they're talking about right because same, i don't need anybody else's freaking thing right i don't need anybody else's permission like spotify or apple music or right <clears throat> i just have and if i wanted to i guess if, as soon as i get a second mirror like in new york now it's a decentralized now it's decentralized because there's two of them yeah <laughs> uh this first one <clears throat> this uh alice wants to go to a new social media app yeah. people have talked about this for a long time what all that needs to happen for that is for my information on Facebook to be stored in a, in some kind of database that is a universal format that other social media. Um, well, there's also, I know you don't, you're not interested in this, <laughs> but, uh, there's Mastodon, right? Which is a federated, uh, social network where you could have a, a, a profile on one site somewhere that runs Mastodon. And then, linked to places on other uh, websites across the network. And the only difference between that and this is basically instead of, you know, putting it on somebody else's website, you're just hosting it yourself. Um, I was interested in Mastodon until I tried to use it. Yeah. It's kind of terrible. <laughs> well, yeah, because you, it's like and, when I start first got onto Mastodon, right. It was like at the height of crypto crazy. And yeah. so, no matter where I went, if I was like, oh, I'd like to see what other, because I didn't follow anybody because I didn't know anybody on Mastodon. Right. I'm like, give me the universe. And I'm like, oh no, not this. No, I'm not. No, I'm not joining your crypto website. No, no, I'm not joining. No, no, you may yeah. not scam me. You may not scam me. You may not scam me. You may not scam me. <laughs> uh, the interesting thing about Mastodon is HK and I were thinking about um, before he was going to do his email service. We we're kind of bouncing around the idea of doing a uh, like an events and art and entertainment focused social media um, thing, yeah, based on Mastodon. Okay, where just real quick, the idea was you'd be there'd be a couple different levels. You'd be an you know an entertainer, a venue, a promoter, or a fan, and based on which of these things you were. And based on who, which of these things you could get permissions from the the webmaster for or whatever, you would have different things you could do on on the service. And then we were that was going to sort of be the back end, and the front end was going to be an app where you would go. You'd have no idea it was based on Mastodon. You'd just go, "I'm in San Jose. I'm in Gainesville. I'm here. I'm there." And you'd have a feed, and it would be you could follow people or whatever, and it would be you'd be able to find events, know where they're at, but you wouldn't be like posting everything. Because that wouldn't be what it was yeah. for, but the, the, then um, I think it was mostly my idea. HK was just bouncing around like ways that we that it would be able to be implemented with me, and then I decided not to do it because it sounded like a ton of work, and it sounded like I needed like fifty million in venture capital to do it. So, <laughs> yeah. So those were interesting stories. I don't know what Web Five is. I think that I think that a lot of these tech billionaire types. They get like so far out ahead of themselves with these ideas that they haven't completely thought through and they just, yeah, they kind of put it out there like as if it's fully baked or something like as if they've right. thought through the whole thing when in reality they just went on like a vision quest and took five hits of acid and imagined web five <laughs> like, and with Jack Dorsey, that's not entirely impossible. No. It, yeah. That totally could happen. So um, I web don't five. I did. Somebody, one, some article I read on this, I, I actually, had, this is not from my usual Ars Technica source, 
I actually had a couple of sources and found IndianExpress.com. I don't know. Had the best article I could find on it. But somewhere they said that uh, the term Web 5 comes from combining Web 2.0 with Web 3. So you add the numbers up and you get Web 5. <laughs> Whatever. Which, which is silly. <laughs> A great mind like Jack Dorsey shouldn't be bothering with silly things like arithmetic. Right. Right. <laughs> ah, so I guess it's my uh, turn now. Unless, yeah. What do you got? Unless we have more on it. I just got two stories. Um, you had mentioned Tesla earlier and this is a SpaceX story. If you remember a couple of weeks ago, I didn't cover it cause it wasn't, there wasn't seem to be much there, there. Um, right. Some of the SpaceX staffers, you know, these are like, these are like, people who do space stuff. So maybe they might have a certain sort of professional reputation. They might like to uphold as they might like yeah. to move on to JPL or NASA or some other job in the future. And Elon Musk's behavior on Twitter, especially as it related to Twitter, uh, made some of these people a little uncomfortable about their association yeah. with SpaceX as you, you know, as it might be if you're a rocket scientist, right? Yeah. <laughs> if you're a rocket scientist, <laughs> you might not want to work for a drama queen who spends their entire day insulting everyone on Twitter. It just seems <laughs> like that's not the kind of person you want in your social circle or your professional circle. So yeah. there was a letter from some of these, uh, some of the people, some of the more vocal, I'd say more brave people, all things considered inside of that company based on Elon's past behavior around criticism. And, uh, it got out. It was published in a couple different places. And so Elon just started firing people. Of course. Now this is fine. Like generally my view on this kind of stuff is that you buy the ticket, you take the ride. Um, if you're yeah. going to go out and criticize the CEO of the company you work for, you have to understand that you may get fired. The problem I have here is that this is in direct con contradiction with Elon Musk's entire reason that he claims he bought Twitter. Right. He doesn't even want your tweet to get taken down if they don't, if, if it's bad, but he's perfectly okay with removing your job. And yeah, and I read parts of this letter and they weren't like calling him names. This letter was well written. Um, and fairly respectful in its tone yeah not Do they call out specific behavior or like or specific tweets or anything or you know i was a cop to not having read the whole thing um okay <laughs> but the tone was very very much respectful and they were they were certainly not like like for example i might call elon musk apartheid clyde they certainly didn't do that. Like there was nothing there. Were, they weren't insulting him. They weren't, they weren't saying SpaceX was a bad place to work as a result. It was mostly just that, you know, if you're a rocket scientist, you kind of have a reputation to uphold. You're a rocket right. scientist. And sure. Yeah. I mean, maybe, maybe some of it was their egos clashing with Elon's, but it just, it's in stark contrast to the way he was talking about the reasons he's buying Twitter. And it's his party. He can fire whoever he wants. I just think it makes him look like a hypocrite. And I also think that the people who work at SpaceX are probably some of the best and brightest people in the world. And it might behoove anyone, not just Elon, to listen to what they have to say. Yeah. That's, and I mean, that's the whole story. People can think what they want. Elon stands. My, um, my Twitter is, what was that? M A Courtney one. And you can direct your, uh, <laughs> oh wait a minute no elon stands you can find wait me wait a second <laughs> elon stands you can find me on uh twitter and bother me about it um i just don't think that it yeah i just think that it shows great hypocrisy after he complained about cancel culture um oh yeah and yeah, somehow like i'm not shocked no not <laughs> at, at all <laughs> no his his the way he's dealt with criticism in the past has been has ranged from firing people to calling a guy who didn't like his toy submarine a pedophile and sicking his millions of fans on him. Yeah. Yeah. The, the mo was actually, that was one of the most disgusting things I've ever seen a powerful person do. And yeah, so that was pretty messed up. So, but th that's why I said the people at SpaceX who did this were actually pretty brave because they knew he did that too. Yeah. You can't work at his companies and not know about that incident. 
Our second story. Well, hopefully, oh, go ahead. Hopefully they get jobs at uh, um, the other guy's uh, <laughs> space company. Well, these I mean, they're not <laughs> all nec- Blue they're Origin. All, they're not. Yeah. Well, they're not all necessarily doing jobs that are a hundred percent specific to space travel, too, right? Right. Yeah. So, I mean, these are like material scientists. These are these are just uh, yeah. compute. They're software engineers, but these are going to be the best and the brightest because they're sending stuff into space. So, like I said before, yeah. I just think it would behoove any CEO to listen to these kinds of people if they're under your employ, because they're, they didn't get there by not being thoughtful and not being smart. So, and our last story, it would be fun, except that it's not fun. (laughs) It's like how making fun (laughs) of Scientology is fun, but then you think about it a little more and you're like, actually, this is fucking terrifying. Well, there goes our monetization on this video. I did not know about this. So, So both of these stories actually come from the register. The register is like a a tech news site, but it's focused on enterprise stuff. And I, uh, I read it a lot. Um, one, because part of what I do during the day is to sell enterprise, uh, computer hardware, but also it takes a certain tone and the articles are short and they're not trying to spin a narrative. You get a lot of good information without reading, without reading a lot of somebody's prose. These people are work at the register because they know their stuff, not because they're Ernest Hemingway. So Apparently, a religious cult has uh, some undue influence at a film studio group inside of Google. Now, we understand that the film studio group inside of Google isn't exactly a huge department. Um, So, this is going to be a small department. And is this is this a film studio like as part of YouTube making the YouTube videos, or is this the uh, internal videos for? Google or do you know? Uh, Control F brings up no mention of YouTube in the article. Okay. And the register is known for being, uh, known for giving you all the information that they have. I believe this is inside of Google. It might have, might, might be something. Remember when they were doing Google TV and it might yeah. be kind of some, well, something kind of leftover <laughs> or whatever. I don't know the we're, exact. We're still doing Google TV. <laughs> uh, I don't know the exact like structure of this. Uh, the, the, you know, the, uh, the department is small though, by all, by yeah. all, um, everybody says this department is small. So the cult is called Fall- Fellowship of Friends, and the, they have a compound. It's in oh. Oregon House, California. Not Oregon, Oregon, but Oregon House, California. There are six hundred people at that compound, and the co- the cult is small. It only says it only claims to have fifteen hundred members. Um, the leader is Robert Earl Burton. He used to be a winemaker. Uh, now there are serious allegations of sexual assault exploitation. Those have been settled out of court. And wow. the accusation is it's the same as it ever was. It's like a nep- it's like a nepotism accusation, right? It's like where if you are part of this cult, you are more likely to get hired into this particular group at Google. The whistleblower was a contractor, not a Google employee. And uh, as you might be, if you think there's a cult controlling the department you're working in, this person was a little freaked out and decided to like, blow the whistle and uh they were fired yeah wow well i guess you don't um i guess as a contractor you're not fired the contract was terminated yeah contract terminated um that that's bad but was the oh um so like youtube had a film production unit that made videos and like series for youtube usually youtube premium right um and i don't know if they're talking about that it doesn't sound like it it sounds like that it, if it's in google internally to google google itself they have a lot of videos that are made just like internally to show cuz google is a really big company right and they they have to have videos for google employees that actually are are well made and everything but also they they also do some like ads and stuff for projects and i think uh the projects that I was on had some of that like training and, and ads for uh, what, what I worked on. I'm wondering if that's what they're talking about that production. So there's, group. I think the details on this are going to be a little bit uh, fuzzy for a while. Cause I believe there's ongoing litigation. And yeah. when I popped in, I forget that it was Google film studio group is the name. And when I popped it in, it was really hard to find any information as to like what they're yeah. doing. Um, in fact, the term Google film studio group, for all I know, they, you know, maybe the person writing the article didn't know the actual name of the department. And so they had to, 
say something. Or maybe those are the words that were being used by the contractor and that's not the actual name. Or maybe it's just not Google's business to broadcast the name of every department inside of Google out to the world because why would they? Right. There's some probably probably some pretty Orwellian sounding names inside of there, actually. <laughs> but this is, you know, this is not uncommon, not like for Google, but this is not an uncommon way for a cult to operate where right. somebody will get a foothold inside of some other organization and hire up members of the cult in order to yeah. generate basically generate income so that they can get money from the cult members who are employed by a someone like Google known to pay a rather high salary. Yep. And so this yeah. is definitely something that's in my ballpark and we'll be keeping an eye on this. And this Thursday, we're, if we can, we're going to try to find out anything we can about this particular cult and do a little bit on it for our cult cool. satanic panic stream. And that's every Thursday at nine. And yeah. that's my entire segment. This has yeah. been, uh, well, I, I will have to say though, if, if it was the actual like YouTube, uh, uh, production, company whatever group or whatever that is could explain why all their videos are really bad <laughs> like they had one hit i feel like the only thing that that came out of that studio that was good was cobra kai and then they sold that to netflix so <laughs> so yeah i don't know the years of this it it seems like it's fairly recent um just by the like they didn't like if it was five or ten years ago the article would have said so this seems right. fairly recent um, so I'm, you, you probably know better than I do. And I'm guessing that you're, that if, if we had to, like, if we had to like make an educated guess that your guess of like, this is for internal videos or maybe on occasion, they'll make videos for ad clients who don't want to make the video themselves, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. I'd be willing to bet because again, it seems like it was a fairly small department and that's why it was easier for members of the cult to get a foothold in there. Whereas right. I bet that YouTube studio that was trying to make TV shows was uh, not a small department. It was a whole ass movie right. studio, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it may not even be really, you know, part of Google, you know, right. or YouTube and uh, it I, could be outside contractor. And it's been quite some time since alphabet became the parent company of all these companies. It doesn't right. feel like yeah. it, but it's been, it's been quite some time. Yeah. Uh, time is compressed and screwed up and whatever. Cause we've <laughs> all been stuck inside and getting our groceries and food delivered and stuff, but it's something to keep an eye mm -hmm. on. And it, it's sort of, it, for people who are maybe not familiar with some of the other stuff we do, uh, the fact that this was about a cult was a really good reason, I think, for me to put this, to put it on the, on yep. this show, because we do like to talk about cults and control groups here on our other on our other show, our live show on Thursdays. So, uh, Matt, you, you want, want to read, read the show out? out? Yeah, you want me to read it out? <laughs> HK's not here. He he, need, he usually needs the practice, but yeah, go ahead. Um. I don't even know what what we read out. So uh, uh, thanks for uh, joining us. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to give us a thumbs up and subscribe and maybe leave a comment down in the comment spot. Uh, if you found any of this interesting or feel like you have a comment. Uh, if you listening on podcasts, go check out our, you know, you can find us anywhere on any podcast podcatcher but also on YouTube or on uh, podcasts, uh, check out our other stuff from Echoplex Media. Uh, what, what do we do? Echoplexmedia.com is, uh, has everything, I think. That's the best place to go to find out everything except for about this show because I haven't really added to the website properly yet because I'm lazy. <laughs> yeah, we got to get that. Uh, this, this show is brand new, so we, we're still working on getting it everywhere. And what's our Patreon is... Echoplex Media, right? It's uh, patreon.com slash Echoplex. Oh, just Echoplex. I never know when what has media at the end and what doesn't. <laughs> well, I mean, you, you probably know how we determined that. Is where the where Whether it was available? It was free, right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> where it was available. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. Well, thanks everybody for uh, checking the show out, and uh, we'll see everybody in the funny papers or on your news feed or whatever. <laughs>